great to have you here. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to defer quickly to my my amazing panelists and have them explain a little bit about what they do, um, the organizations they work for, and sort of where they are in this in this spectrum of of uh, getting involved uh, in impact investing. So I'll start with you, Anna, to my left. Uh, so. My role, I have a couple of different roles at uh, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Uh, we also have US Trust under our umbrella, just for people who, if I use those names interchangeably. But uh, so I head up manager selection uh, across equities, fixed income, uh, and alternative investments. Uh, but about five years ago, joined a small team of people who were really interested in the emerging impact investing space and uh, now lead and co-lead co the impact investing strategy uh, along with my colleague who's here, Jackie Vanderbrug and Surya Kaluri. Um, so across US Trust, uh, Merrill Lynch, uh, and the, base, the overall wealth management business at Bank of America, um, you know, we, we are, are basically trying to do two things. First, and, and these are equally uh, important, so, uh, one is actually reflect all of the, the, the commitment that Bank of America has as a corporation uh, to alternative energy financing and ESG as a whole. Uh, and so about five years ago when we were starting on this effort, uh, we, we asked our clients, are you interested in environmental financing? So Bank of America, $125 billion commitment, how do you reflect that in the, wealth, in the broader wealth management channel? Uh, and they said, yes, we have a really, we're, we're interested in, in environmental investing, but we're really also interested in, in seeing how we can deploy capital towards social causes. So the ESG effort was born, and we, uh, a, a small group of us, uh, which has been growing, uh, has, has created the impact investing effort, sort of a grassroots up uh, initiative, which, which um, you know, it, I, I'm proud to be a part of. James? <clears throat> Well, thank you very much for, for inviting me. Uh, my name is James Scriven. I've been in the development world, I think, all my life. Um, development investing all my life. I worked in a mortgage bank, then over a decade in IFC, and now I head the private sector arm of the IDB group, the development bank for Latin America. Um, we are used to and very accustomed to be having these discussions because most of what we do is impacting investments. It had different names in different times, but when we look at investments as a development institution, we do it with a triple bottom line. Development, ESG, environmental social governance, and obviously commercial returns. Um, we're an institution that operates across Latin America and the Caribbean with an investment thesis of development. Um, and investing our own money. <clears throat> Maura. Sure, good morning. My name is Maura Riley Kennedy. I'm a principal on the private equity investment team for Newberger Berman. Um, Newberger Berman is an employee owned, 100% employee owned asset management firm. We manage about $250 billion of assets um, across equities, fixed income, and alternatives. Specifically within private equity, where I am, we manage about 50 billion of assets. Um, and we do this in primary investing, direct co-investing, private credit, secondary investing, and a number of specialty direct strategies as well. We have 120 investment professionals with global offices. Um, in terms of Neuberger Berman's approach to and history with ESG or impact investing, um, the firm has been around for over 75 years, and we instituted ESG screens in our equities business starting in the 1940s. Um, in the late 1980s, we started an, ES, or, excuse me, an SRI equities business. Um, in 2007, we started incorporating ESG factors into our primary private equity investing uh, businesses. In 2012, we became a UN PRI signatory. And then I'd say, very importantly, this year, we've actually brought on a dedicated ESG investment team to serve as resource for investment managers and portfolio managers across all of Newberger. So this is something we're really excited about and I think it is really a bit of an inflection point when it comes to the private equity team to have these seasoned group uh, to support us in our ESG or impact investing activities. Rika. 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, pleased to be here today. Um, so I'm from TIA Investments. I'm the portfolio manager for Impact Investing. TIA Investments is an affiliate of Naveen, uh, the asset manager with over $900 billion in assets under management through various affiliates, TIA Investments being one. Um, the firm is actually owned by TIA, which you may know, Teachers Insurance Annuity Association. Um, so our roots actually uh, lie with serving those that um, work for the greater good, uh, which is why responsible investment, ESG, impact, and intentional investing for double and triple bottom lines is part of our DNA. Um, the responsible investment practice um, looks to think about these issues across everything we do as an asset manager. And what I do, impact investing, is a expression of that overall work. Um, we manage a portfolio of over a billion dollars in committed capital uh, in impact investing. Um, yes, it's a lot of money uh, and something we're very proud of doing. We've been doing this for over a decade. And over the past five years, uh, we've invested close to $500 million of new capital um, across um, private asset classes primarily, private equity, real estate, private debt. Um, the portfolio is global in nature. Um, we invest around 40% in emerging and frontier markets and the remainder here in the United States. Um, and, and the intentionality of our strategy is to focus on basic goods and services and products serving low-income and underserved populations globally. Think of things that you and I consume on a daily basis, access to housing, uh, credit, finance, healthcare, education. So we're looking for sustainable investment uh, opportunities, uh, looking for market-based capital um, in terms of return profiles. Uh, we do go out longer on the investment time horizon spectrum given that uh, the majority of our impact investing assets uh, are through our general account, TIA's general account, um, which is uh, uh, focused on paying the claims paying ability of our guaranteed annuities. Um, so the, the billion so do odd dollars that we have uh, in this space is, uh, is all focused on the kind of the strategy I described. Okay, so you've got a handle on who these folks are and, and where they're coming from. I thought maybe, though, before we get into the nitty-gritty, we'd actually try to define terms a little bit. I think there's a lot of acronyms thrown around uh, today in this, some of these sessions, SRI, uh, SDG, ESG, um, ABC. Um, <laughs> no, but I thought you know, maybe we could just try to, to pinpoint, when, when we talk about impact investing, Maybe each of you guys could give me your sense of how you see it as distinct from, uh, you know, or under the umbrella of some of the one of these larger acronyms. Perhaps uh, I'll start all the go start with you. Just we're going to go from Rika to Anna. Sure. Um, so as I said, responsible investment is an overall practice at the firm, um, and impact investing is one expression of it. Um, we think of responsible investment as thinking about um, the environment, society, governance factors with respect to any single investment we make as a firm. Um, and so that is investing in a publicly traded company or a public bond, but taking into consideration factors that have an implication from an ESG perspective um, and incorporating that into your investment decision to buy, sell, or hold. Um, when we think about impact investing, we think about it as a very deliberate and intentional outcome orientation that we're seeking to make through the investment. So either we're trying to create a new good that's previously unavailable, uh, which is tied to a basic service like affordable housing or financial inclusion. Um, and we also, importantly, commit to measuring that impact over time. Um, we don't necessarily always set a goal to say, hey, this dollar of investment must translate into seven new loans. However, we want to measure how many new loans were generated, who were they made to, um, and is the ten trend positive over time, and is there a common taxonomy we, along with our co-investors, can look at in evaluating the outcomes of what we do. And Maura, how do you, I mean, I didn't realize Newberger had, did you say 1940 had first started a screen? Yes, on the Imagine, equity side. Uh, right. Public. I mean, Public, public, side. not the private equity side. Yes. You're on. But I, I'm just curious how, how that's evolved and how you would then see impact investing as a sort of subset of that. 
So the way we define it is material effects experienced by people and the planet. And that can be positive or that could be negative. And given that definition, what do we do? And I'll say this kind of on the private and, and the public side. So we consider what's material. We assess who or what is being material, materially affected. We hone in on those factors, assess those factors, and then take those risks or opportunities into consideration when we're making investment decisions. Where we go a step further, the impact side, everything I said before is things we're already doing in pools of capital that we're managing for the best possible risk-adjusted return. But we're trying to think about where's impact, where's the line between ESG screen and impact. And we think that that line is, is alongside engagement. So on the SRI side, it's our equities team actively engaging with the management teams of public companies asking them for enhanced disclosures, and then reporting on the factors that we think are important on the public equity side. And I think that on the private equity side, because of where we sit, we're often a minority direct investor or we're a fund investor. It's a bit more difficult to effect change in the underlying company, but we can do a heck of a lot in addition to just being a lead uh, sponsor, and, and I'll use an example. So we're a big limited partner in hundreds of private equity firms. We favor middle market buyout firms. I'd say that as an industry, the mega cap buyout funds are doing a really good job explaining what exactly they're doing in terms of ESG or impact they're doing a really good job of monitoring their portfolio companies, influencing their portfolio companies about how to think about ESG factors, and then reporting on those back to their limited partners. But that's a handful of private equity firms. That's the biggest of the big guys, and they're doing a great job. Where I think we as a limited partner, and to the limited partners in the audience, what we together can do is have quite a large impact on the private equity managers who are a little bit below the mega cap funds to encourage them to think about taking ES and G factors into consideration when they're making investments, to encourage them to work with their portfolio companies and encourage them to report to their limited partners on these issues. So I, I think of impact it, it a little bit differently as a limited partner or as a direct company sure. investor. James, how do you define Yeah, the development banks that are focused on the private sector have been doing this for about, give and take, 60 years. And what this means is that that has evolved over time. It started being to do no harm. So when you do mm -hmm. an investment, make sure that you're not harming the environment. And gradually that has evolved to positive impact mm -hmm. as opposed to do no harm. And with that evolution of the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals and how important it is that we have a positive impact on the work that we do. Yeah. So when we look at an investment, we have a measurement, an internal measurement from one to 10 about not only the commercial aspect of the investment we do, but more importantly, we call it internal delta, it is a measurement of the development effectiveness of the work that we do. So how many jobs we've created, all the indicators of access to electricity, access to financial services. So very specific data by which we decide if we prefer one investment rather than the other. So I think that evolution of having a positive impact plus a very clear intentionality of what you want to do and how to measure it measure it, has to be, been the evolution of all our institutions. Nana, what do you yeah, So we use the word impact investing to describe a number of different investment approaches, and we realized that uh, for a number of people, uh, the word uh, impact investing did, you know, connotes this type of investment approach where you have a, uh, almost a control or direct ability to impact something. Um, and, you know, and a lot of times that's associated with the private markets. 
um, you know, we started out this initiative and we're, we're writing about values-based investing and values-based investing doesn't always go over well with a more pragmatic or commercially you know, aligned client base because there's some trade-off that's associated with that sometimes. So we you know, spent a number of months talking about this and, and arguing about it internally, uh, our marketing team and the investment team, and then we said, oh, let's just go ask our clients. And so our clients came back and they uh, overwhelmingly liked the phrase impact investing uh, because uh, you know, as Clara Miller from the Heron Foundation uh, has famously said, all in capital has an impact, um, but they liked it better than the sort of acronym soup of uh, right. values or ESG. Um, Jackie was one time talking to a client who thought she said that they were she was going to invest with ESP, which actually would be really helpful. As a <laughs> but um, but but you know it's it's not it's not a um, it, it, it was it was something that we chose for our clients, and you know we we have a big umbrella because. Um, you know, uh, most of our clients' assets are not in the alternative investment space. They're in public equities and public fixed income. And um, we think you can have an impact um, if you certainly me move uh, hundreds and billions or trillions of dollars, which we have under uh, management towards companies that are making a positive impact, you know, trying to do positive solutions, outcome orientation, or, or at least trying to be good corporate citizens of some shape or form. That's impact. All right. I mean, if, it, would it help, I think it would help me anyway to understand maybe in micro, in some detail, an instance of an impact investment along, that sort of meets some of the criteria, the objectives that you um, have all kind of articulated. Um, maybe something, I don't know, let's start with you, Rika, down at the end. Sure, I mean, maybe examples provide more tangible um, um, viewpoints into what we do. So one area, which has experienced tremendous growth in our portfolio uh, is actually here in the United States. Um, it's focused on the preservation of existing affordable housing stock. So if you turn on the radio in New York in particular or San Francisco, uh, you, you hear about affordable housing and the shortage every day. Um, one in four households in the United States doesn't have access to affordable housing, i.e. affordable to them. Um, while a lot of affordable housing in the United States gets built and developed um, using um, vehicles like tax credits, uh, existing affordable housing also needs capital to keep it viable, uh, to make sure that uh, there's the right amount of capex put into the properties to, to sustain the communities that live in them. And so that's a big area of focus for us because it's traditional real estate equity capital that comes in when the tax credit investors or other types of capital providers are ready to leave the project because they've received um, their tax credits. Um, so an example of that is we just invested, um, closed on a transaction with a partner for preserving over 30 affordable housing properties in the Baltimore U corridor um, in Maryland, um, and most of them focus on seniors. Um, so these are great properties um, that are housing seniors who make you know, less, significantly less than 60% of area median income. Um, they pay their rent on time. These are fantastic properties that provide a good cash on cash return, uh, but need aligned capital to keep the residents in place to make the improvements, be it environmental um, or programmatic, to continue to have them be viable communities, both for the, the surrounding areas, but also for the residents. So that's an ex one example um, how, of an impact investment. How will you measure the impact or the success of that investment it, you know, from the triple bottom line or however you look at it? I mean, what would, what would you use to measure that? Yeah, so there's a few things. Um, and this is actually the, an easier example of impact measurement because you can measure the number of units of affordable housing that exist and how many you preserve. Hopefully you preserve 100% of them. Um, that's the goal. Um, so that's one measurement. The second is the quality of the real estate with respect to uh, current available green retrofit standards for affordable housing. How do you make the properties more efficient, which will impact the bottom line, but also will have an environmental impact? Uh, because green building technology has evolved quite a bit since the past 20 years when that building was created. So we measure those outcomes, uh, greenhouse gases and emissions. Uh, energy savings. And then finally, programmatic, um, I would say softer pieces. Um, if it is a multifamily um, uh, property that is housing families with children, what is the common space being used for? Is there an ability to provide some programmatic intervention with after school programs provided by nonprofits that are looking for space? Um, these are often communities where 
parents cannot afford to send their kids to after school programs um, on a you know, paid basis. But the bus comes in at four o'clock and the kids are there. So uh, how do we make them um, use their time more productively to make also the property more safe? So there's various metrics that are actually a lot easier to measure in affordable housing than say something like you know, financial inclusion, for instance. I actually, I'm gonna jump, go international for a second, James. I mean, how, you know, that's an, a really interesting microcosm or, or example of how you can do this in you know, 30 houses or 30 dwellings or area in uh, Baltimore. How do you take that to, and scale it on a global level in Latin America, where, which is where you know, your focus? So for, first of all, to get scale in this business, you have to go to the emerging markets because unfortunately where most of the poor people in the world that do not have access to a wide range of products and services are not sitting in the developed part of the world. Mm. So we need to focus our attention. Baltimore is a good start. Where we, wanna, where, we really, where we really wanna grow. I live very close to Baltimore. Mm. Um, where we really wanna grow and where we really wanna have an impact. So that's one. Second, in, two big areas where a lot of the impacting investing is thinking about and having an impact is climate finance and what we call gender finance. So I'm not gonna focus on the first because I think most of people understand and have seen how investment in the climate space has happened. I wanna focus on gender finance. Uh, gender is normally measured as how many women are on board or are employed by a company what we in the development world have looked at is that if you are a woman and own a company, there's two thirds more likely that you do not have access to financial services in emerging markets. So we've looked at that as an enormous development challenge for us. And a lot of the work that we do is actually provide financial services to women-owned SMEs. It traditionally, if you look at the value chains of the large companies, that's where most of the financing has happened for women-owned SMEs. So when we look at the impact of the work that we do is how to get to that market, increase the access to financial services by providing financial services, money, but also knowledge to adapt the product and services for that. Too. Can you give me an example? Can you give us an example of, of a successful investment? So a few years ago, I met the CEO. I have met him a few times, but I had a conversation with the CEO of Itaú in Brazil. And the first question we asked is, how many women-owned SMEs do you have in your portfolio? The answer is, I don't know. When they actually looked at it, they, thought, they saw that while 50% of the SMEs in Brazil were owned and operated by women, only 10% was in the portfolio of Itaú. Hmm. So the work that we did with them is actually for them to understand where they are and how to access them and then make it a bit more public. And as we speak, we're issuing a bond for Itaú in Japan, where there is a big retail market that is willing to invest in gender finance bonds. So these are, this is one example of the many. They might want to also look at doing that domestically in Japan. But um, that's fascinating. So, how, so you, and you do, an, you underwrite or guarantee the bond so that the first yeah, loss or whatever it might be is. Some big. banks or some issuers cannot issue in the retail markets and some of the developed markets because of the rating. So we come in with our AAA rating and enhance those bonds for it to be, for it to be invested in the retail business. That's interesting. From the private equity perspective, I mean, can you, I mean, was it particular fund managers that you choose? Are there, I mean, can you give an example of something? That it's a little bit of both. I'd say on the fund manager side, on the true impact side, the funnel is narrow for institutional, backable, impact, measured impact funds. I mean, we know Bain Capital just raised, TPG's Rise Fund just raised and, and did incredibly well. There's a, um, a number of other funds out there, but if I think about my investable universe, if I'm just going for the best risk adjusted returns, it's huge, it's massive. Um, I think that 
we, what we can do is play a part to support these up and coming or new managers with a focus on impact. Um, but that's something that's going to, frankly, take time. It's not going to happen overnight. That's on the, the fund side. And then more on the, the co-investment or private credit side, um, again, what we're doing right now is investing out of pools of capital that seek the best risk-adjusted return, understanding that we're overlaying an, an ESG screen. Um, an example, because what, we've, what we're doing right now is, is thinking about an impact program. It's just conversation right now, but what we did as an exercise is let's go through the deal flow that we actually have or have investments that we've actually made, and where can we find examples that would be appropriate for an impact mandate? And this is actually a really interesting point that you just brought up, and I, I'd love your perspective also, is domestic versus international. It is perhaps, quote unquote, easier to have scaled impact outside of the US in the emerging markets. So a couple of the examples that uh, I'll cite are in emerging markets. So one of them is a Peruvian for-profit education company. Test scores for children in Peru are abysmal. Of the, say, if out of a scale of 100, they're in the, in the teens. Terrible test scores, terrible education system on, on, the private, on the public side. So what a private equity firm that we've partnered with is doing is created an affordable and very high quality for-profit group of schools. And what they're doing is measuring. They're measuring the test scores. They're measuring the affordability. Um, so those, that's an example on the, on the direct investment side of, of an investment that we've made where the GP has a goal to develop the best education system for profit in Peru and is really measuring against their goals. Anna? Yeah, so instead of maybe talking about a specific deal, I'll maybe talk about uh, client, uh, some client engagements. Because normally, while we are you know, looking for impact investing uh, investments across the spectrum, uh, and you know, we've, we've had uh, a couple of you know, the high impact deals, the social impact bond or pay for success deals that we've done, you know, highlighted and, and, and you know, right now sort of seemingly have a barbell approach, right, which is public equity and public fixed income, and then these highly innovative small social impact deals. Um, you know, we are looking for everything in between, but what helps us inform our work actually um, is, is clients coming to us and saying, you know what, I want to start moving my, my portfolio towards uh, you know, sustainable cities, uh, clean you know, uh, at infrastructure, you know, clean energy solutions, um, you know, social justice to the, you know, and, and, and you know, outlining for us, and I've, I've worked with a number of clients in the past year who come in and say, here are the areas that I'm interested in, um, but they don't have any uh, you know, knowledge about what products, right, are, are, are there to actually meet those needs. And so, um, and you can find, I mean, uh, RF mentioned the Muni space today uh, in, a, in a slightly different co uh, context, but, you know, you can find really interesting, and you're starting to see in the Muni markets in the U.S., really interesting um, sort of impact-oriented uh, strategies emerge, right, that actually will, you know, on the public side fulfill um, a lot of clients' um, you know, goals around, uh, you know, both investing either locally and or, or socially. Um, and, and, you know, and, and they, the, the, these clients a lot of times want to invest in these very high impact first, uh, you know, impact oriented deals, but actually on the, on the individual uh, ultra high net worth side, start on, in their public portfolio. Um, and then start try to feel comfortable, right, in the in the sort of market rate return, um, or or on or or in private equity, which is a market rate return and mm -hmm. and, and has a sustainability or, or impact tilt to it. Um, but but they but but what we're seeing in that marketplace right now is sort of starting in the public portfolio, um, moving that, and then investing in. Uh, and in individual deals where they have a demand in, in a, an area that they've sort of d defined for us already. All right. So, what? Okay, this is. I think we have a pretty good framework for understanding this. I, mean, I guess the question is, how do you how do you, how do you get more money to flow towards impact investing? Um, 
I mean, Rika, you said uh, TIA has done about a billion dollars, but you're also a trillion dollar asset manager. When do you get to, how do you double, which is still only you know, 2% of assets under management, how do you get that to, what are, what are the kind of impediments, say, internally or you know, with c customers that need to be overcome to get that, those numbers up? So the UN Sustainable Development Goals um, are a great platform to have that conversation internally. Um, it's, um, as you know, Arif mentioned earlier, uh, people first thought maybe, you know, hey, what, what is this thing? It's the UN, but it's really gotten momentum. Um, when you walk past the Pfizer building, at least three months ago, I remember, in Midtown, and you see the SDGs are plastered on, I mean, that says something. People are talking about it, looking at it, and... Um, and there's a bit of a call to action. So what that means for an asset manager like us is, of course, thinking about the SDGs across everything we do, right? So we have a responsible investment team that's focused on um, uh, translating what we already do into SDGs. But in the private markets, the fantastic opportunity is it's allowing us to have a, a really meaty discourse with our colleagues who sit you know, next to us in private credit, who sit in the infrastructure team, who sit in the energy team, uh, the farmland and ag team. Um, and what we've done over the past six months or so is developed a checklist to think about, hey, if you're going to be underwriting a deal, um, you, you know, a credit tenant lease, um, think about the building that's, you know, that's being financed there. Uh, what are there lead certification standards that exist um, that you can query about, right? Uh, can you be doing transactions that actually have a higher sustainability impact? Um, similarly, in agriculture, what is the conservation angle uh, that you can pursue? And what we found actually is unbeknownst to these teams, they're doing a lot of SDG aligned transactions. Those were not intentional, let's be yeah. clear. But now they're becoming intentional because they have a tool uh, in the form of a checklist and teams to go to and talk to and say, hey, I'm hearing about this interesting deal and um, I think it qualifies. What are the questions I should be asking the issuer? Uh, what are the questions I should be asking the sponsor uh, to really drive this in the direction that, that really makes it impactful? And I think that's a huge opportunity for us as an asset manager um, and also for you know, bringing other investors along um, on what we do. And Anna, I mean, you, Merrill Lynch has a massive, you know, the thundering herd, I guess it used to be called, <laughs> of uh, wealth managers. I mean. What, how do you get them thinking along, you know, about impact investing? And then, then how do you sort of further that, how do you get their customers to, to sort of understand it, maybe even ask for it? Yeah, so, you know, 15,000 advisors uh, times multiple clients, uh, you know, and, and, and two and a half trillion dollars uh, under management is a hard uh, it, it's a hard nut to crack from an adoption standpoint. You know, obviously there's been a couple of regulatory things going on in the industry, <laughs> um, and there are people's you know focus on 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 and, on and and our business model is just constantly changing, right? Um, <clears throat> and so when we first started talking about this and what was available, I mean, education is is by far the biggest hurdle, like in in the space that I work in, hands down. Uh, it is. It is not a. You know. I think that a lot of times, um, not the, the advisor, the advisor. Let, you know, people vilify advisors as this. They don't care about impact investing at all. Um, if you understand what an advisor does all day long and how much they actually have to, what is on their place to actually do, right? Um, you know, think, thinking about all of these different investment approaches in a new space is not necessarily, you know, something that they're 100% focused on, right? And so to try to, you know, to, when we started out, we were training people on like, you know, this is ESG and this is what impact means and, and sort of taking that route and trying to educate. Well, you're, you're trying to educate people who are being educated about how to talk to their clients about DOL at the same time. I mean, it's, it's in, so what we did was say, okay, well, well, let's turn this, you know, I think as this conference actually is doing in a very different way around the institutional capital community, but let's start talking about how this is a business case for your practice, right? The, the clients that are interested in this are the very clients that we want to retain and, and help grow. Um, they're the very, they're the very, 
uh, professionals that we want to attract to our organization and you want to attract to your team so that your practice um, can stay on for, for years and years and years and stay relevant. And I think as we began talking about, um, you know, and, and, and I think that, you know, doing deals that, that, that people, you know, notice and, and being differentiated, right? Using this as a differentiating mm -hmm. uh, factor to talk to, you know, have something new to talk to your clients about. Um, resonates a lot better, but there's still, a, you know, that, that sort of gets your foot in the door, but there's still a huge amount of education that has to go on about, you know, like I said before, clients come in and they know what they're interested in. And actually the SDGs I like because not only for the corporate space, right, but they provide a really good way um, to have a discussion around tangible tangibility, right? Mm -hmm. Like clients really like, ta like to talk about water or you know the renewable energy or things that they are consuming or feeling or reading about every day not sustainability or ESG it doesn't it just doesn't resonate with them and it doesn't re resonate with advisors either we find out right it's, so yeah. talking about like these tangible the S, these SDG sort of tangible um, things and then you know weaving in in education and figuring out how to scale education is it's a huge hurdle for us and we're, st we're still trying to figure I mean, it out. Just to follow up on that is yeah. you, you 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 look at the millennials um, and and the sort of the way a lot of these uh, the sort of values that are articulated by the SDGs um, are kind of their their way of thinking about the world so do, is this actually the is this do you guys see this as a particularly at Merrill um, as a, as a sort of, you're going to have to get in front of this because all these kids someday they'll have money. I mean, they're all living <laughs> with their, in their parents' basements, I guess, still. But, um, um, but I mean, is, is this sort of like you got to get there because they're going to come to you and say, you know, you know, how are you, you know, I want a triple bottom line portfolio. Yeah, I mean, there, there are, there's actually, you know, there's real demand that we see um, how it translates into you know, the floodgates opening up in terms of AUM is, you know, I, I think that that's, uh, it, that the, the hurdle around that is education, actually, right. because again, millennials may understand and know what they want to invest in. They have no understanding of actually what investment approaches or what vehicles they can use to do so. Now, I mean, I'm overgeneralizing, but, but it's still an education, even if you're really predisposed. Investments is an education, number one, right? Um, and number two, you know, how to, how to translate these things really into an investment that then you feel good about investing in um, is, is something, it, it, yeah. it, you know, there, there's still that hurdle there. Um, so, so, but we do, we are responding, our whole impact investing initiative is a response to client is a response to client demand, but it's a response to client demand in the future, but also the clients that are sitting um, as our clients right now. I mean, everyone know, you know, baby boomers don't, you know, they don't, they don't uh, answer, you know, the way the impact investing industry might like to, that all of them are interested in impact investing, but they're in the That's US. That's another reason baby right. boomers are ruining the <laughs> But they're the most Sorry. philanthropic <laughs> people in the entire world, right? The, right. You know, and so, so it was a joke. right, yeah, but 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 it's but it's you know but it's reorienting them right that you don't you don't make your money here and you give it away over here that those things now actually can be integrated and when you have discussions with baby boomers and they realize that they are as interested they just don't you know stand up and wave right. their hand and say I'm really interested in this tell me all about it so that's right. our hurdle yeah so James I mean you you have you're a multilateral lending institutions a little different but i mean i suppose how do you think you can yeah. i mean in, in a way ideally you will cease to exist ideally <laughs> right i mean no if everybody gets into this if people see this as the way in, in investing um you know they'll what do we need you for so first i need to agree with everything that has been said because i think first of all the un sustainable development goals give a very clear target of what has to achieved and what I've learned all my life will get measured, what is measured gets done. So I think putting numbers around that helps a lot. Second, unfortunately, your statement's not going to happen anytime soon. Because if we want to achieve the development goal, there is a paper very well written by Multilateral that talks about going from billions to trillions of dollars. Yeah. So this is not necessarily just, okay, let's add another billions of dollars. We're talking about massive amounts of money to actually achieve these. And I wanted to say just two statements. One, the role of technology. 
I was amazed that I participated this year in the mobile conference that happens every year in Barcelona in February. And when I went, walked into, and this is a place where you have half a million people debating about the role of technology, the statement was, this is the only industry in the world that can actually affect the 17 sustainable development goals. I had never seen something like that before. Hmm. So I think the role of technology will have a massive effect on this. But the other point that I wanted to say is that each time you sit around LP, massive investors, when you ask them what is preventing you from investing in these, very, in these areas, seldomly it is returns. Most cases, there are things that they don't know how to measure, they don't know how to measure and, and work on. So some of the things that normally come out is regulation, sovereign risk. It talks about local currency. It talks about integrity risk. Seldomly it is, I'm not getting the returns. Hmm? So I do think that as responsible investors, we have to move away from just looking at returns per se and be an expert on returns and stop being more experts in risk of changing regulations or helping governments be more sustainable over time on regulations, get a better understanding of the local currency risk that is affecting all this, construction risk, integrity risk, so areas that are very, very different from our traditional investment philosophy that would actually make a difference for, for investors to look into these markets. Mm. And Mara, how do you get more buy-in? I mean, Newberger Berman, it's, you're, you're sort of early, you're, you're scaling up in this area, you know, yeah. and, and what, I, I what do you do to get buy-in? One of the questions we've been struggling with over the last number of years was, will interest in impact translate into capital allocated? And then the second question is, if capital is allocated, can we or other investors with a stated impact do it right and do it in a way where there will be attractive financial returns? The first question, we've, we as Newberg or Berman have put our money where our mouth is, I think, in, in hiring a, a deep senior team who is dedicated only to ESG and call it a, a couple different things, ESG impact investing to serve as a resource to the firm, and especially where I sit, to private equity. Um, and then the second question, are the returns there? Again, that's a bit introspective to think about what is our deal flow? What has our deal flow been for the last 10 years? Are there certain deals that we actually do deem as appropriate for impact? And, and kind of coming up with the answer to, to that question too. So it, it's two-sided. It's, um, I think we're going to open up to questions. Just one, qu one question before we do that. Is there sort of like a thing that needs to happen, like an aha moment where people, I don't know, I think about, you know, Bill Gates and what he did with, with, on the philanthropic side, did open to some degree the floodgates, billionaires putting their money into the, the, the you know, half their funds or whatever it was into, um, what is it called, the giving pledge. Um, is there something, and that's charity though, that's philanthropy. Is there some sort of, or has there already been one? I'm just, you know, something that just sort of, the sort of big bang, as it were, that sort of puts impact investing on people's minds. I, I mean, I, I would say, you know, two major storms, 74 wildfires and things like that, maybe putting things on, on, onto the people's radar right now, for instance, uh, in, in sort of this climate-related craziness we're living in. But I think a lot of people thought that Paris would do that. I think, I think there's a... Um, but I think in investing, investors like a good proof statement. Yeah. And a good proof statement doesn't take decades to play out, but doesn't take a year or two to play out. I yeah. And I think that um, US investors are different than uh, European and Asian investors are different than uh, US investors in a lot of, in, 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 in how they need that proof statement to play out and what they need to actually see. But I think that we have, we're seeing a good, a really positive proof statement play out, but I don't know if you can, you know, I, I agree that you need to have a policy that opens the doors. I mean, look at what happened in the venture capital space. So I think that the, that's, you know, in the, in the ERISA uh, policy that, that took place now two years ago, I think it was good, but it didn't op necessarily open up the floodgates. Um, so I think policy you need, I think you need a different perception of risk. Mm -hmm. um, I think you need to have, uh, 
for instance, you know, asset allocation that, that is viewed differently. Um, someone asked me at the PRI conference a couple years ago, why isn't any money flowing into the emerging markets? And I'm like, have you seen the percent allocation to emerging markets and any institutional asset allocation? Right versus the amount of money that's needed to flow into the emerging markets, like that. You know, th those right. are those are real structural hurdles that you know. But but I think that there's still um, and, and 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 convenings like this and why we're supporting it, right? Because there's a proof statement that's being built up, and as, and if we can get that proof statement out, I think it's not it's organic rather than sort of this right some you know, aha turn. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, you know, I also think the, the investors that are already in the space have to lead by doing and showing and talking about it um, and doing more of it. Um, the, the GIN has put together a institutional advisory board and an institutional investor initiative uh, focused on, you know, sharing and creating, uh, you know, some shared practices, uh, case studies, um, not just the what we invested in, but how did we invest in it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of value in talking about what went wrong, right, and being very candid about it. Um, it's not you know all roses, right? So it's uh, sometimes deals go bad. So do in traditional investing. And so I think uh, those of us who are in this space have to you know just constantly be, frankly, you know, just evangelizing about it. Okay. So I think the aha moment was the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and I think there is, and everybody's speaking, speaking about this, a momentum of millennials requesting this from their investment portfolio. There is a generation in the middle, we talked about it, the Generation X. The best generation. Exactly. We're, we are, most of us are in that <laughs> space. And we need not only the do good things, but I think we need a return on our investments. And we're taking the investment decisions today. So I think the shift has to happen mentally for the generations that we're all sitting in this room, that it's not only about development, it's about business growth. So when you talk to a head of a bank or a commercial entity, and you tell us, and you ask them, what is your development goal? They're not gonna be able to answer what they want. Mm -hmm. But if you ask them, what is your business plan today? and how can you multiply by 10, you will be talking about the same thing as development. If you tell them, for example, most of my investments are in rural San Pablo, for example, you said, okay, if you wanna grow, where do you have to go? I have to go to the rest of the states in Brazil, for right. example. That is for us development. For them, it's expanding their business plan. So I think when we move away from this concept of development that is normally saying lower returns to actually expanding your business plan, that is when the conversation is gonna get going, at least for the generation of all of us in this room. Okay, I believe we have mics around. If you have a question, please put your hand up. Um, you know, don't, uh, don't be shy, tell us who you are. And of course, get right to the point. We, right here's... Uh, <laughs> Great, thank you very much. My name is Nina Schwalbe and I represent an NGO in Pakistan called Heartfile and thank you to the Abraj Group for inviting us to be here. And my question is about this nexus between impact investing and philanthropy, which you've touched upon. And I'm curious to know to what extent you think that the, the, the enthusiasm about impact investing is investing traditional investing, uh, sorry, is moving traditional investments to impact investments or to some extent people are moving their philanthropic donations to impact investment? That's a good question. James, you want to tackle I personally think that both need to happen. Um, where the big money is and the big impact is a traditional institutional investors moving down into the space, but I still think that there is a big role for philanthropy to move into the space where testing new technology, testing new ideas, is going to be vital for these things to happen. If you look back at how climate finance has happened, a lot of what today we look at as traditional climate finance, five, ten years ago, was really risky new technology business. And there's where I see that this role, normally people refer to this as blended finance by testing new ideas with, with foundations and others attracting investments to do at this early stage. I do think that both need to happen. Anna, do you, I mean, I'm just wondering, you guys have 
as you said, you mentioned ultra high, ultra high net worth individuals. Do they, are they seeing it as very distinct opportunities or are they blending them along the lines of the question? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it's different. It, it, uh, it's different depending on the clients that you're talking about, but in general, um, you know, we, we, we're seeing them still as two different pools of capital and they're thinking about it, uh, in, I think, in, in, in a way that, that philanthropic, but there's not a market-based solution for every issue out there. I guess this is the right way to say it, and clients get that, right? So there's, there's not a market-based solution, there's not a return, there's not any sort of, an, you know, scalable cap but that, 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 that exists. So in, in addition to de-risking or addition to providing, you know, a, a capacity for growing the space, I think there are just, um, you know, our, our clients, you know, most of our clients aren't using their philanthropic capital for that. That's where a lot of more of the foundations or endowments obviously are coming in, um, but um, and, and more need to. Um, but but uh, yeah, you're seeing it's probably two different pools of capital still because they're 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 still disassociated really. I wonder. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think actually for investors, institutions like ours, it's very important to be clear about that we're not. We're not replacing philanthropic capital or charity in any way. In fact, there's many sectors, stages of uh, activity which we cannot participate in. Um, and so that's part of the myth debunking we had to do when we restarted our program five years ago, right? Because we essentially were, were asked the tough question in committee, why are you getting a return on poor people, <laughs> right? And that's not what we're doing. We are not replacing the free school. We're providing an alternative for those, the working poor, who are looking for a better option, for instance, in emerging markets. So I think it's a very important distinction. Be curious to see whether some NGOs or organizations shift their approach as a result of the, the, the potential for investment from impact investors. We had another question here, down here on the front right. And then we'll go over there in the back. Thanks. Uh, my name is Valerie Grant, and I'm with Alliance Bernstein. My question is for Anna and anyone else who would like to respond. Um, how, how do you advise your clients or advise the FAs who are advising clients on asset allocation and wealth planning if they have um, a desire to be more responsible with their assets? It seems to me that that's a missing link as, as people talk about shifting more to emerging markets or perhaps shifting between uh, public equities and private equity, but that has the risk of distorting the overall um, risk and return profile for the client if it's not done judiciously. And I'm just curious to understand any tools you might have in that regard. Yeah, so so we don't, we don't think that to be an impact investor, you should change your asset allocation at all. Um, you You... You might want to perceive risk in a different way, or you you might, uh, but 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 it but asset in asset allocation it, like if you are 60 40 equities fixed income right uh, there are plenty of vehicles right where you can at least get a best in class or sustainable investment approach or maybe even use some thematic strategies and there's a lot of actually really interesting stuff going on in the public equity space right now in terms of actually drawing out impact. Um, for however people want to define that, uh, but but we we are if you're shifting your portfolio, you're not changing say the equity fixed income mix or the equity fixed income alternative assets mix. You're you are substituting in uh, or deploying new capital to uh, those those opportunities in in different asset classes. Um, you know, in the public market space broadly, we think you do not have to give up return at all to, to invest in a, at least a sustainable way. And so we don't think you need to change the asset allocation. Um, in the private assets uh, space, you, know, you, you, are, you are looking at um, individually with the client what areas of impact they're interested in and, and folding in um, impact-driven private equity or private debt investments um, you know, and, and hedge funds, if you can, um, to to that to to that. So we're not changing the overall asset allocation. It, it's a it's a, almost a substitution policy, if you will. Question in the back there. Hi, I'm Kathy Dolan uh, from Locus Advisory Services, and we advise community foundations who are trying to make a greater impact in their place-based strategies. My question is to actually all the investors. Uh, each of you mentioned uh, examples of deeply impactful uh, investments that you have in your portfolio, be it in Peru, be it social impact bonds, be it the affordable, preservation of affordable housing. 
Um, my guess is those are, as great as they are, a really small percentage of your total assets under management under this umbrella. Uh, the, this conference is about scaling impact investing. What's keeping you from doing a whole lot more of this? Super question. Yeah. So? Well, I mean, I, I think that some of the transactions sizes are smaller, right? So, you know, the affordable housing preservation deal we talked about is a $50 million size, but it's 30 plus properties. It's because the, the size of those properties are not the high rises, you know, 15 CPW, right? So um, it's uh, the, the, the scale is because of the ventures that we're backing or the, the sponsors that we're backing. Uh, but I think that some of the things that were considered social impact because of the very fact technology has enabled them to scale very rapidly are going to command a lot more capital in their series f you know e rounds and then then we're going to we all are going to struggle to get into those deals uh and so the the impact investors that you see particularly in emerging markets or, or you know venture um are getting in when the deals are very small these sponsors need the type of backing um, that is currently unavailable um, but the other way you scale it is through thinking about SDGs across everything we do as asset managers. Like I gave you the example of our you know, energy infrastructure team. When they're thinking of their next hydro project, it's about not just how many megawatts are you going to generate, but um, you know, what, is, what is the ecological impact of that project? What is the community impact of that project? Um, and taking those into consideration. Yeah, I would just say there's nothing holding us back from, from, and, and from, doing, from doing this other than your regular investment due diligence and you know that you do on any investment i mean outside of the impact investing space we don't do you know every deal we see right. um, and that's never going to be the case in the impact investing space either um, so so you know but there's nothing holding us back from from trying to uh, provide scale i mean to Rebecca's point i think what what would be helpful in this industry for for large pools of capital is a, an efficient way to aggregate capital, right? And I think why, again, why we're interested in conversations like this is because I think that the, that is highly inefficient uh, right now in the impact investing industry. By the way, it's not extraordinarily efficient, right, in the non-impact investing industry, but I think aggregation of capital and figuring out how, you know, you do have uh, an ability to absorb larger pools of capital is something that, that, um, that uh, that, that is needed in this space, but it's not something that's holding us back from trying to scale it as much as we can with the, with the great and many uh, solutions that are actually out there now. Right. And the, the only thing I'll mention is something I, I already did. And again, introspective, if we invest in one company, there's a certain amount of impact that that one company can have. But as a large limited partner, we can have influence on hundreds of different lead general partners to help influence how they're thinking about environmental social governance issues, how they're thinking about impact, how they're reporting to their limited partners on these issues. And that's a way where I think each dollar can go pretty far. Last word, James. Yeah. So 100% of what we do is impact investment. So the question for us is how do we crowd in more people? And reality is, I, I made some statements before about what are the risk factors that people are seeing. But the biggest thing for us is that we operate in the difference between reality of risk and perception of risk. And I think there's where we have to reduce the gap about thinking that everything like this is not necessarily risky in its nature and getting to understand these markets and these sectors much better. Well, that is all we have time for. I would like you to please uh, applaud and thank our panel for giving <laughs> great things. Thank you very much. <laughs>